You're listening to Season 6 of Fried, the Burnout Podcast with your host, Kate Donovan. Fried exists to hashtag end burnout culture, to help listeners release any shame, blame, guilt, or judgment that you have about burning out, and to create spontaneous moments of healing through recognition of shared humanity with other people who have experienced burnout and lived to tell the tale. Fried and its associated Facebook group are free resources provided for you from our hearts. Our paid work includes keynote speaking and one-on-one coaching. You can find information about that at katedonovan.com. And now, here is this week's Healing Packed episode. Fried fans, it is time for another episode of Fried the Burnout podcast. Your Sunday sermon, your Sunday burnout sermon, you know that I love showing up for you on first thing Sunday, pretty much anywhere you are in the world, to give you some hope and some inspiration and just a sense of validation that what you're going through doesn't mean that you're alone and you're not crazy and There are other people that have been there and done that and actually lived and thrived to tell the tale. So today, one of those thrivers is Becca Powers. She is an award-winning Fortune 500 high-tech sales executive, founder and CEO of Powers Peak Potential, best-selling author and speaker. In her 20 plus year career in sales, she's worked for large companies, including Cisco, Dell, and Office Depot, achieving President's Club seven times while leading teams of 110 plus and hitting 500 million in annual revenue. Becca intimately knows the struggles that have come as a cost to her high achievements. Through nearly using it, losing it all from extreme burnout, she was forced to discover a more supportive and sustainable path to success that she now teaches to others. Becca. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Now, we usually start, we always start when I have a guest with their burnout story. So I am going to sort of sit back, probably mute myself and let you fly <laughs> let <it go. laughs> and just let you go. And every once in a while, I will hit something and I will think, oh, shoot, we got to talk about that. It is possible that I will attempt to interrupt you. If you are on a roll, you can be like, wait, 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 I got this. Perfect. But yeah, interrupt away if if you're there. I'm going to sit back now. Let her roll. Okay. So here's my story. I like the bio, not because it highlights my achievements, but it like gives you like this buildup of like, hey, I do all these things because the crash, my friends, was just as high as the accomplishments. And uh, this is my story. This is what happened. So in 2013, I was a level one leader at Dell and I believed I'm very passionate and I get very passionate about my beliefs. And I believe as a leader that people come before profits. That's my mantra, people before profits. And I was speaking it and championing it. And then I get recruited by a company with the same mantra. And I was like, heck yeah, I'm going for that job. And I did. I left Dell, went to this new job. It's um, motto, again, kind of supported that people before profits thing. The thing is, I had to take a pay cut to go into that, which already hurt my energy. I didn't know it at the time that it would be like the first stab in my burnout downfall, but it was. And so I go into this role. I was in high tech. I went into healthcare staffing. And I can just summarize by saying within four or five months, I knew it wasn't a hit. but. I am resilient. (laughs) I can power through anything. And I powered through for about three years. Towards the end of the three years, I was working 12 hours days. I was extremely exhausted. Um, I was overworking, overstressing, overcommitting, overwhelming all the overs that could possibly be there. And I'm also a mom of four kids. I have two stepkids and two of my own kids at this time. They were all in middle school. So very, very full plate. I had a team of salespeople under me. Like there was a lot going on. And I just like to share the fullness because so many of us have the full plate and we don't really get to talk about it. And we kind of be like, oh, I'm okay. Well, 
hmm, are you really, you know, you got a full plate. It's okay not to be okay. Um, and so anyways, I had a series of about four bad days. They were four bad 12 hour days. And it's not my proudest moment, Kate, but this is like what happened. I come home from work on the fourth day. I've got my purse on my shoulder and I walk through the door and my kids like light up to see me like eyes wide, huge smiles. Mom, let me tell you about our day. And I look at them and I'm like, can I put my fucking purse down? And I'm like, I need five minutes, guys. And I just, it was one of these moments in time where like everything slowed down into slow motion and I could see their eyes go sad. I could see them curl in and shame that they even approached me. Like, and I just remember sitting there thinking, I have no capacity for them. I have no capacity for myself. Who am I becoming? You know, is this the mother I wanted to be? Is this the person I want to be? Like everything I'm working for is for them. And I can't even be there to greet them when I come home from work. And it um, started a spiral of thought, deep thoughts. So um, just to move it along that night when I was getting ready for bed, kids are in bed. I did my best to recover from the situation, but once everything was quiet and I'm taking off my makeup for the day, it all, all that emotion of what I had been powering through for three years came to like a screeching, like right up into my face. And I fell to the floor in complete exhaustion. Like and fatigue and mental breakdown. Like I, I think it was a nervous breakdown, but I, I fell to my knees and I just started crying. And I was so powerless in that moment that I couldn't even stand up. And so then I just started like shouting out to God, universe, whatever you want to call it. I was like, hey, I haven't prayed to you in a long time, but uh, I can use some help right now because I'm <laughs> kind of at a low point. Um, and in that moment... I get what I call my instant miracle. When I had left Dell, I had my VP of sales at that time was very supportive of my decision and understood like, hey, people before profit, you'll get to sit on an executive board. You'll get to do things there that you won't get to do at Dell. And he's like, Becca, you're the CEO of your life. And so when I was broken on the bathroom floor, all of a sudden I remembered that I was the CEO of my life. And it kind of made me chuckle. It was kind of like one of those really messy moments where I'm like crying and laughing and doing all sorts of things. But I remember thinking, if I'm the CEO of my life, then I'm a lot more powerful in this situation than I thought. And it gave me enough empowerment that I was able to rise up off the bathroom floor. And I say now... Um, with full confidence that I rose off the floor, a different woman than the one that went down. There's a, oh, there's a lot to do here, folks. I want to start with, I was just a few months in and I knew it wasn't right. Yes. I bypassed my own knowledge. And it's okay. This is a, a tricky, nuancy situation because I don't believe that we can go through life being like, this isn't right for me, gotta go. Because that can turn into an avoidant pattern, which is also unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So looking back on that situation now, how would you do it differently as the person you are today? I, I feel I would have checked in on myself more. So in that How? moment, in that moment, I felt it in my gut. I felt it in my body. My neck pain started, right? And I dismissed it as, oh, I went to the gym two days ago. I probably hurt. Like I was just dismissal. And, um, you know, with the awareness I have today, I would have at least, and I do this now in real life, I check in with myself about once a month, like, 
okay. Like you say, you don't want avoidant patterns, but it's, it's just being aware, like, is what I'm doing serving me or is it sabotaging me? And sometimes we have to make decisions that have a cost to it, right? We're human. Like this is going to zap my energy. So this weekend, I want to make sure that I get a spa day in for myself, or I want to write because that gives me energy, whatever my geeky things are, right? I now know that if there's a zap, I need to fill it up. Um, I didn't know that then. Hmm. This is a huge thing that we talk about a lot on Friday, especially when we're talking about working with core values, that when you know what your values are and you can work according to them, your life gets better. But working according to them means that you're doing it like 60 to 80% of the time. Like almost no one is doing it over 80% of the time because it's that's idealistic and utopian and not realistic at all. Right. So when you have to, for whatever reason, you are making a decision to go against values number two, four, and five this week, I always say you have to pay yourself back. I right. So that. you're saying like, if there's a zap, yeah. there's this thing, it's the same concept. Like if we're going to make a sacrifice and we know we're making it, I don't want to do this thing, but I'm going to, because I know it's important to my friend and I need her to understand that I'm there for her, even though this is going to cost me, for instance. Yes. The thing is going to cost me doing something for my friend isn't going to cost me, but the thing that I have to do for my friend is going to cost me. How are you going to pay yourself back? I think that's really important. The next thing that you said, and this is something that's in your book and in a lot of the work that you do is the the overs. Can we go through the overs a little more slowly? Because yes. this is just too uh, I good. Get the goose, I get the goosebumps. Yeah, and, this is too good. Um, I am going to digress to the unders first because they're okay. very connected. Um, I call it stage one and stage two, and they're intertwined. So stage one, I feel in all my research of burnout, I'm very um, interested in your opinion of this, that burnout ignites in feeling undered. And whether that's undervalued, underpaid, under-resourced, under-recognized, under-appreciated, I mean, you can put the under attached to it, but that makes us, it triggers our worth or it triggers um, deeper feelings of being unseen, unheard, and feeling like we don't matter. And when that happens, we over. And in my situation, so I'm going to go and answer your question now, talk about the overs. But in my situation, I was a fish out of water. So I did feel underappreciated, undervalued, misunderstood. Those All those things were triggered. And so what happened in my story is, what do I know how to do? I know how to work. So I overworked to try to prove my value. I overwhelmed because I don't feel like I fit, like that something's wrong. So I'm overwhelming and overthinking, trying to get in front of it and trying to fix it. Um, I'm overcommitting because, hey, which, what, again, like it kind of falls into that overworking space for me. What can I do? I can overextend myself. I can overcommit. I can make that plate a Thanksgiving plate. And then I'll feel like what I'm doing matters. Um and I think that's really the state of the overs and what we don't realize is that we are overdoing it. We are, um, we, we feel under, so we overcompensate by doing and it's in the extreme doing without, like you said, that recalibration is, is a servant Am I, I'm zapping, but I'm not filling back up and then we get depleted and, you know, more severe symptoms and stuff happen, but I'll pause there and see what you. Well, you know, where you want to go with it and stuff. So the research is fairly clear so far on a lot of parts of burnout. And one of the things that I think is missing is that there is a thread underneath all of it of a lack of worthiness. Yes. Right. And that, so I think I, I agree with the unders in a big way. And it's interesting because I think the only thing that I would add to the unders, the way that you describe them is that sometimes we are genetically and neurologically set up because of our histories or our parents' histories or their parents' histories to feel the unders, even when our actual environment isn't supporting them. So yes. we interpret things as being the unders, even when they aren't. And, and we interpret things when they're the unders, when they are. So we get both ends of yeah. it. If, if we have this sort of pre 
set up? Because our survival, like, is like you were saying, like our survival is it's it becomes part of our DNA. What did it take for me to survive my environment? For me, if I go back to my childhood, um, my mom and dad were hippies, which were fantastic. Um, but they were also hippies, which meant they partied a lot, played in a band, did lots of things, lots of people around. I wasn't always center stage, right? Or and so for me to get the attention, love, and acceptance I wanted from my parents, I had to overachieve. I had to do, I had to over a lot. And so and if I didn't over, then I felt like you were saying, like the unders, I felt under appreciated or under recognized by them. So the two are very connected to our childhood. And so when I got into this environment and I wasn't naturally the golden child or whatever, um, it triggered all that stuff from my childhood. So you nailed it. It was just like that environment. <laughs> All yeah, over again. set it off again. And there's an interesting um, rat study that, you know, rat parents neglected rat babies. They kept them separate, you know, and through that neglect, there was an epigenetic change on the gene that informs your stress response system, how it's supposed to function. So they didn't have a proper stress response from neglect. Wow. Wow. And so this is an epigenetic change. So and I know that epigenetics, everybody is like, um, if you, if, if your DNA is a keyboard uh, or a piano and, and your genes are the white keys, epigenetics are like the black keys. Like you, it, they adjust things a little bit. They make small changes. And the thing about them is that you, they are changeable within your life. So there are studies that show that being a huge recipient of a large amount of love and support actually changes your epigenetic pattern. So this is why I'm like, please go get a coach. Yeah. Like please, please sit with someone who can tell you that you're amazing for three months because it's not just good for your mind. It can literally change your ability to respond to stress in the world. So I think that that's important, but the overs and the unders, the way I've talked about those things not in that succinct way for such a long time. And when we met the first time and, and you were saying it, I just sat there like, this is what genius looks like. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> like, this is exactly it. All these unders are overcompensated with by all these overs. And they don't ever get us. The overs don't ever get us what we're hoping for. Hoping for. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the part like I could almost hear. And that's why I know you're passionate about this work. And I am too, because I feel like getting to this deeper level is what is going to help people shift out of burnout. Like people, you know, we, we're kind of joking around like burnout prevention doesn't exist. I think that if it was ever close to existing, it would be understanding the unders and overs because anything after that, I call like, um, stage three questioning belonging. Like once you're starting to consider, should I stay or should I go? Like you're already in burnout. Like you're there, you're just at varying degrees, right? So like, you, there's not much to prevent. We're now talking about healing and overcoming. Yeah, yes. That, and that's what I think is the, I think that's an important part of why I think burnout prevention is sort of a misnomer. The other, I don't think it's a hundred percent a misnomer, but I, I, there's like a, there are cancer statistics that say 33% of cancers are um, preventable by lifestyle change. So 33% of cancers that happen in the human species right now would be prevented if people lived better. But that means that 67% of cancers would still happen, even if you did all the right things. And so I think burnout is similar in that way. Like they're taking care of yourself and going through some early therapy when you're a kid and dealing with some of these feelings mm -hmm. of neglect and, or whatever happened in your world and sort of handling yourself as you're growing up and learning new coping mechanisms and having coaches and therapists and really good friends and leaning on people and creating community. All of these things are burnout prevention factors, but I feel like the people that could have prevented their burnout that, you know, if it was 33% of people could prevent it by, they already did those things. Right. 
And you, and if you didn't do those things and you're 40 and you're getting there, you can't go back and prevent it now. So why are we talking about that? Like we have to talk about what you can do to heal. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. How can you get the agency to change your direction, to change yeah. your choices? And I think that's a really, really valid point. And one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking is like, a, it's it's almost like, a coming back home to yourself. Like mm-hmm. I feel burnout mm-hmm. is a very external um, response to us seeking externally what we weren't able to either give ourselves internally or like you said to our childhood, just didn't get like, like it. it's not programmed in us to know that we have the innate wisdom within to give ourselves everything that we need. That's just like, like maybe only 10% of people come out that way. I don't exactly. even know. I'm sure there's studies, but you know, like, I don't know them, but I'm sure it's yeah, not too I don't many. know, but I don't think there's many. Right. And so I think for me, um, you know, even just for listeners, like a really practical tip that helped me come back to myself is really, um, it's not, not cheesy. Cause everyone's like mind, body, soul connection, but it was really like, I put my left hand, I use it. I learned this in Kundalini yoga because I'm a Kundalini yoga teacher too. But if you put your left hand on your heart and your right hand on your gut, your gut, the gut instinct, but your gut often knows before our brain knows. And so does our heart. So I've, I've learned over the years to pause when I'm in a panic and put my left hand on my heart and my right hand on my gut and just feel my body. Like, you'll feel a yes. Does this, does this decision I'm about to make support me, serve me, empower me, help me, or does it sabotage me? Is that me disempower me? And, and just that simple thing has helped me. And we're talking about agency, regain the ability to make my own decisions. Yeah. I think that's massive. This episode of Fried is sponsored by our partners at Qly.ai. If you're struggling to make healthy changes in your workday that will lead to long-term well-being, I might just have the solution for you. Qly.ai uses a combo of your input plus magical AI technology to help you build healthy habits into your calendar, Slack, or Teams for as little as the price of one fancy coffee a month. By syncing with your calendar, learning your habits, and using its customized formula, Culy will send you break notifications at convenient times throughout the day, reminding you to do things like take a walk, eat your lunch, drink more water, and more. By learning your schedule, Culy will cue you when you actually have a moment to take action. When you're burnt out, making changes can be hard and feel overwhelming. Culy is designed to make it easy and to move with you through your burnout recovery journey. To get started with a 25% discount, head to qli.ai forward slash fried. Fried fam, if you want your sleep to be more restful, I want you to get in a guided meditation before bed. This boosts the time you spend in deep sleep, and that is one of the ways you recover from burnout. Go check out the Sleep Meditation for Women podcast to make your sleep more sleepy. And as a bonus, for the month of November 2022, you can win a gift bag filled with over $300 of incredible health and wellness products. Enter to win in three easy steps. Step one, subscribe and listen to Sleep Meditation for Women. You can do that by searching Sleep Meditation for Women in your podcast player right now. Step two, leave an honest review on Apple Podcasts and tell my friend Katie what you loved about the episode. Step three, screenshot that review and share it on Instagram or Facebook. And while you're at it, tag at Women's Meditation Network and boom, you're entered. I want to, and I I know I can do this with you because you're open and, and up for things, but I want to challenge you a little bit. Yeah, let's go. Of this, um, we're going to go into ego slightly. This sort of statement, like I I walked in, I had no capacity for my children. And the thing that I was telling myself was everything that I'm doing is for them. But that was bullshit kind of. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, in that in the 
I think I believed it in yes. that time, right? Because mm-hmm. all my choices were, again, on that external, like I am main provider of my family. I'm working 12 hours so I can put dinner on the table. I think like almost everything I've ever heard my parents or adults say growing up was like feeding this frenzy of my actions and my beliefs at the time. And then the thing is, and I'm really glad that you challenged me because this is a good challenge for the listeners too. I actually became more successful when I gave myself more time and space. (laughs) 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 And I'm guessing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, created more capacity for your children. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. And myself. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I wanted to bring that up really exactly as you said, to, to challenge the listeners a little bit, but I like to not let them know that I'm doing that. So I challenge you instead, Um, (laughs) (laughs) but now they know. So like secrets out you guys, every time I challenge somebody that's on the podcast, it's for your benefit. Um, Uh I'm just trying to sneak it in there for you, but the, the, this is something that we hear all the time. I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it for my children. Like your children want you to not be an asshole all day, every day, and to have some energy for them and to sit with them and to like, you're trying to provide the wrong things sometimes. And I'm not saying that it's okay to be like, to not have a home and to not have safety. And I'm not saying that you can all quit your homes tomorrow and your children will be happier living on the street than they will have a house. Like, no, like, let's not, we're not going to extremes here, people happy medium somewhere. But what I am saying is there's probably a lot of things that they could do without if they had yes. more of you. Agreed. The adjustments might not be as big as you think. So one of the things that I learned just to kind of take that to a next yeah. level is that In hindsight, what I have learned is when I was surviving, my kids were surviving. Mm. And when I'm thriving, my kids are thriving. And I could tear like this was years ago and I can still feel it. And what was kind of also funny and tragic at the same time was that now their adults are 18 and 21. And during COVID, we did therapy for them. And the amount of emotional neglect that they genuinely felt and rightfully so. And from somebody like, from my point of view, if we're going back to that, that perspective, I thought I was doing everything I can. And I thought I was doing everything right, but I was doing it the wrong way. Hmm. And so it left them with two or three years of feeling emotionally neglected by me. And they were my most important thing. So to sit in therapy and listen to their perspective, like nearly ripped my heart out. But at the same time, it's like, that's the thing I had to be present for. And if anything, it, it increased my desire to be a catalyst for change and awareness for other other parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. This is something, this is my, um, one of my favorite pieces of feedback from clients. My kids are happier. Yes. (laughs) Like I get the goosebumps. It's like, yes. And they're healthy. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. They want you. Yeah. They might be throwing tantrums about the backpack, not being the expensive, fancy one that the other kids have. That that's what, that's what the tantrums might say. That's what their words might say. Cause they don't know how to tell you. That's not, kids don't know how to do that, (laughs) but they want you. They do. And you, your, your health and mental state is so critical for them. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing. It's like, it, it, it's, and it's, it's, I don't want to blame society, but just saying like, there's that societal pressure to yeah, work and to hustle and, and all of it. So I it's mean, I real. blame society a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God. I'm like, we want to go on a tangent, but I didn't <laughs> want to bring it in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it is, it's like. It, it especially back then, like this was 2015 that I was just starting to come out of this, right? Like yeah. for me to want to slow down and, and be present, um, almost made me feel like a failure. And I had to deal with 
being okay with all that. Like what's most like you were talking about it before, but for the listeners, I think it's really important to understand what your values and your priorities are. And for me and Kate, I'm interested to hear what your opinion is on this. I find that I thrive best when I have three to four that are really important to me. I used to have 10, <laughs> you know, values? Well, p- p- things that were important, like I'd have oh, work. God, you, no, you can't have 10. Oh no, I used to like, I'm like, I got this and I got this and this, projects oh, no. and committees and things like that. Like, keep it simple, man. Like yeah. two to four, that's Max. my zone. And I, th- and if it starts getting bigger, then I'm like, I got to redecide. Like that power of choice comes in. Like, do I want to up this one and down this one? Or do I want to say, I can't take this on right now, but very good segue, Becca. And I don't know if you did that on purpose, but ladies and gentlemen, we're about to talk some boundaries. Yes, I did it, but I love those boundaries. <laughs> Me too. When we spoke the first time, you said something about boundaries that I I thought that I was the only one saying. I remember. And I think it's really important to have different people use different voices to say similar things because you hit different people that have different ears and different experiences. So when you were talking about boundaries, the way that you speak about them, I was like, yes, yes, this is, this is same, same, but different as they say in Thailand, right? This is same, same, but different. And I think really such a mindset shift so I'm I'm going to sit back for a moment and let you dig into how sure. you view boundaries and how they can be better used because you were just saying like, do I need to, if I need to reevaluate this list, how do I, I need to say like, I can't take that thing on right now. I have no capacity for this yeah. thing over here. How do we do that in real life? You know? And, and how I came on, I mean, so I was going to say how I came on to healthy boundaries that are in a way that feel good. It's kind of surpri- like, I was like, it's boundaries with a pleasant surprise, which listeners are probably like, what is going on right now? Um, that happened on accident. But then like, once I started studying shadow beliefs and all my, the trauma awareness and all that stuff, I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense of why it happened like that. But um, so I'll, I'll just use, continue my story. So I rose off the bathroom floor. I didn't know what the heck was I was going to do. I didn't know. All I knew was I was empowered and I was not going to let myself or my kids hit the bathroom floor again. That's all I knew. So like the next day I go into work and now I'm faced with like real life. Like I have to act different if I want different results, period. And so I get, I'm a leader. I get called into the office because there's a new project and this is my zone. This is my overcommitment zone. I'm like new project. Yes. Let me say yes. And, um, I wanted to like that inner, like, Oh, I got to say, yes, this could be cool. It could be impactful. I can change. And then I had to stop and think if I say yes to this, what's going to happen in real life. I'm going to be overcommitted. I'm going to be exhausted. All the things that just got me to that bathroom floor are going to happen again. So I'm like, I have to say no. And in my head, I was like, okay, I'm going to say no. And, but I don't want to give like a hard no. I want to still want to be able to help. And so in my head, I'm racking, I'm like, who on the team wants to rise? Who on the team is looking for experience? And so instead of saying no, I said, my plate's really full, which is truth, right? Plate's really full. However, You know, this person has been looking for an opportunity to take on a project and once has, she has really, really great ideas too. I think it would be better for you to bring her on and give her a chance than to take me on. I'm already into other projects anyway. And what I didn't know, and this is the part, like, I can't wait for you to rip on this. What I didn't know at the time is that I did actually in setting my own boundaries, not only did I get the positive effect of giving myself more time and space so I can decompress and heal, but I also helped somebody else rise that ended up getting a promotion a couple months later. And then I I became a mentor and I didn't mean to do that. (laughs) I know it's so cool. Full goosebumps. So I want to give another set of words to what you just said, that by building boundaries, you can create space for other people's growth and success. Yes. 
and not just in a working environment. I, we're doing a lot on kids today. You all know that I am not a mother. So I have a different view on this that, you know, I know is not fully informed. However, I'm going there anyway. Setting boundaries with your children helps them to learn and grow and be successful. Yes. hundred percent. hundred percent. And that is helps them with their confidence, you know, and their self-esteem because they're like, oh, I can. And they can ask for help. It's okay for Mm -hmm. you to be in a support role. That's I'm not saying that you should just walk away and say, figure it out, kid, which is quite often (laughs) what my father did. Um, (laughs) Go figure it out. Go figure it out, kid. Um, But there is. I, I think that the big challenge is that children are actually helpless when you get them. They just are. It's not yeah. a lot they can do without you. And as they grow, learning when to shift things over to them from you is challenging for a couple of yeah. reasons. One, because everybody grows at a different rate. So there's no perfect age for a lot of things. Two, because now that you're in this mode, you like to feel needed. And if you give everything over, then are you still, are you still necessary? Right. Yeah. So well, yeah, we tie our identities into it. right? Exactly. Three, there's this. Oh, I lost my train of thought, but it was a good one. Damn, sorry. <laughs> no, that's I okay. Like, I was like feeling it too. I was I like, know. yes. <laughs> Man. Okay. Two, three, is it back? <laughs> no. yeah, right. But when you're setting boundaries with your kids you and, and allowing them to grow and learn new things, they are doing exactly that. They're getting their confidence there, you know, but, and you don't want to do it. This is what we were saying, right? You don't want to do it because of a few reasons. I think one of the things that like really holds people back is when you stop doing it, they keep growing and it's kind of scary. Yeah. I've had a lot of people say that to me. It's like, it's scary to watch them grow. Like if they can do it, then what the heck? And, oh, this is what I was going to say. I knew it would come back if I just kept talking about it. Oh my God, I lost it again. (laughs) I didn't even speak that time. I was like, don't speak. No, I know. What is wrong with my brain today? Uh, oh, because it takes too long. Yeah. Because we don't have the capacity and the patience to wait for them to figure it out. It's just easier to do it yourself. And this is a pattern that that holds true, not just with children, but with life in general. Like if I can just zip up your jacket for you, we're going to be out of here faster. Yeah. Rather than sitting through and waiting for somebody to bumble through it themselves. You know, it's, it's fascinating that you say that. Cause I have, to, yeah, you're like, I got it. Out. <laughs> yes. But you know what? I, I think, um, just to, I always like love to like pull out practical nuggets when I can, when I hear something. And I think this is an area where a practical nugget can be applied to a listener. So if you're listening and you're like, okay, how would I go about doing that? You know, if I'm bringing back the, the frame of reference of like, Hey, you're the CEO of your life. I'm the CEO of your life. It's like, what is your role and are the actions and responsibilities that you're doing support the role that you have and want in your life, whether it's at work or at home. And like, I find myself having to ask that all the time being mom. I am an author, speaker, podcaster. I work full time. I got, you know, big family, all the things. And so if I don't delegate, if I don't teach my kids how to do something, I am over capacity, am over capacity like that. And while it might be faster in the moment to just zip the coat, I have to think longer term. If they learn to zip their coat, this is one thing I don't have to do anymore. Yeah. yeah. And so anyway. But when you're in the middle of everyday life, I I can, I mean, I do respect and honor the fact that you are already 17 minutes late because they refused to put on a purple sock and yeah. you know everything turned into a disaster and you just need to zip the goddamn coat and get out of the house. I'm not saying that you have to do it all the time, but 
I want you to, one of the things that I want you to consider with this, this episode and, and boundaries is that, especially with your family, is that when you have the time and the capacity, allowing somebody the space to do something with just your support instead of your involvement mm -hmm. allows them to grow. I love that. I have the goosebumps now. All right. And that's true. Like we said, like that's true at work and that's true at home. When you, when you move into higher management, it's not your job to do all the projects. It's your job to know how to motivate other people to do the projects. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Well, so when you were talking about that, about boundaries, I was like, yes, boundaries are empowering. Yeah. And then you sound, you said something that has stuck with me since that conversation mm -hmm. and instead of pass on it, pass it on. And I just think that that's just like such a nice little phrase that I keep now. I this didn't even know that I said that. <laughs> yeah. You're like, so it's kind of like, instead of passing on it, you pass it on. And I was like, that should be a movement. <laughs> uh, the pass it on movement. And yeah. sometimes people feel real guilty about that, especially in the workplace, because they know that other people are also overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you think people should handle that? If they're like, yeah, I'd love to pass it on, but nobody on my team has capacity. You know, I think that that's one of the things that you could just take pause. Like, hey, let me get like a person leader asking me to do something. Let me just get back to you on that. And then I think it's coming back to the team and saying whether you're a peer or whether you're a leader and just saying, hey, there's this opportunity. Um, is anyone interested? Maybe if everyone's full and you're interested, maybe we can look at maybe recalibrating or redistributing some of the workloads. So you free up, like, I think it's about conversations and that I'm really glad you asked that because I think a part of the human nature too, is we don't like conflict. And so we, we avoid conversations that don't even have conflict because we think that they might. Mm. <laughs> and what I have learned, as long as you're leading with a good intention and a good outcome, you can approach people on hard things and get really wonderful results. So be willing to have the conversation and just leave it open. And and this is a, a, a big thing in my work, like stop deciding things for other people. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Just stop it. Stop it. Because like, what? Well, once you throw it out there, you learn that like, all these thoughts that you had, oh, they don't have time or they don't have, like somebody normally raises their hand. They're like, yeah, I'd love to. My husband was just <laughs> telling me that he shifted some responsibilities on his team. And the person that he shifted some things to was thrilled. Thrilled about it. Right? Like, oh, I've been wanting to grow in this area. I didn't know that that was a, a, even an opportunity for me. Yeah. And when we make that decision on somebody else, we're not allowing them like, you know, in the spirit of the, the conversation of growth, we're not giving them the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Like and this who, is, yeah, this is something no, I've ahead. said on the podcast before. Um, as a speaker, I mean, we know that you will get offered literally negative amounts of money. People will ask you to pay them to speak on their stage and you can get you know, very, very many multiples of thousands of dollars. There's a, there's this massive, massive range for speaking. And when you start, you start off at the lower end and you build your way up over time. Right. And I realized, and when I always go back to resentment turns into boundaries, because I started getting proposals when I was making much, much more money, I started getting all of a sudden I had this rush of proposals that they were like, either we need you to speak for free or we'll give you an honorarium of like $200. And I was like, I can't mm -hmm. do, I can like, I can't do that. And because I noticed that I was resentful, I said, Oh, there's a boundary missing here. What do I need to do? And the thing that I did in that situation was write to my Facebook group because there are other burnout professionals in there, the Facebook group that's attached to the podcast. And I said, hey, is anybody interested in doing low or like low bono or pro bono speaking work? If you're just in the beginning and you're trying to get out there, these are people that are willing to give you 250 bucks to practice. So maybe somebody who wants to practice. Six or seven people sent me all of their information. Some of them 
didn't know how to, they didn't have speaker sheets because they didn't know speaker sheets were a thing because they were just starting. So I said, Hey, in order for me to send out your information, I need you to have a one sheet. Here's what a one sheet is. Go on Canva and make one, please. Right. So now I'm helping people get to where they want to go. I'm helping the event planner find a speaker. And I don't have to do this event for $250 that I would be mad about. That is such a beautiful example because like I I am putting myself in the shoes of the person that's receiving that. And that could turn in to a business for them that could turn into um, increased mood and confidence at home. Like it just, it, that's such a wonderful example of another way that you can go about doing that. So that wasn't setting, good for you, but great for somebody else. Yeah. Well, and good for me too, because now this person that's trying to move into a speaking world remembers me because I helped them. Yes. And the, this person that was trying to book an event remembers me because I helped them. Yes. So not only have I helped these two people, but I've also gained goodwill. I love that. It just works all around. So boundaries are not always a guilt ridden, terrible thing to do. No. If you really look for the opportunity in the boundary that you're setting and you realize that setting the boundary is not only just about you, you can do so much good with boundaries. Yeah. Oh, that just gives me the goosebumps. That's why I always say it's like boundaries with a surprise because I think of a surprise and I think of like, like, you know, surprise birthday party or something. And, and that's what it feels like. It's like there was this whole other world to setting boundaries that had this positive outcome. I had no idea existed. And like you said, it ends up being like the triple win, like everyone wins in your situation. You won, the event host won, the referral won. In my situation, the company won, I won. And now, you know, the new person I referred won. And she ended up getting a promotion too. Like, like, hey, yay. Sometimes saying no is best for everybody. <sighs> That's like a mic drop moment. Can you say that one more time? Sometimes saying no is best for everybody. I just wanted to feel that with my eyes closed. I was like, yes, I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> Becca, I adore you. Yeah. And I'm good so piece. glad that we did this. We are coming towards the end. So what I would love for you to do would be to let people know where to find you, how to contact you. And then if there is a, another thing that you're feeling called to drop, drop it. Okay. So you can follow me. I keep my handles all the same to make it easy. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, whichever one you like. It's at Becca Powers 1313. The website is beccapowers.com. If you forward slash burnout, there's a little quiz in there that you can take and break yourself. Um, but a little, mo- little thing that I'd like to share to close it up is, you know, it's going to touch back in the beginning of the conversation. You're worth it. You know, I just want to go back to worthiness. And, and I think that is really tied to burnout. You are worth prioritizing yourself and your well-being, and that's it. You're worth it. And your whole life will thrive when you thrive. Amen. Pride fam, we are wrapping up another episode where Becca and I both may have cried a little bit, but you know, Mm -hmm. if you've listened to fried in the past, you know that I cry on like every other episode. So this is nothing (laughs) nothing new. (laughs) I am so lucky to have been a part of creating this thing that can serve so many of you. Fried is now reaching by the time this episode comes out, I'm sure it will be more, but Fried is now reaching nearly 20,000 people a month. You guys, 20,000 people a month who need to know, you need to know This can change. Healing is possible. And you are worth it. We love you, Fried Fam. Until next time.